Video coverage of the 27th JCT Traffic Signal Symposium is brought to you by Highways News. Thanks to our sponsors, AGD Intelligent Traffic Systems, Clearview Intelligence, PTV Group, Message Maker Displays, Smart Video and Sensing, SRL and TRL. Good afternoon, everybody, uh, and welcome to the next stage in uh, Viva City's journey. Um, for those who don't know me, uh, I'm Matt Shaw, and I am a product manager at BB City. Um, and today we'll be talking about our robust evaluation approach, comparing the Smart Junctions product uh, versus a uh, long standing mover, which is why we've got Dan Priest involved to provide his uh, professional expertise and to start the conversation of is it time to move aside and make way for the next generation of signal control? Um, a quick crash course on what we're all about at Viva City. Um, so our core product uh, are the machine vision powered uh, sensors. These provide uh, classified data um, to help you assess your road networks um, that we then bring through to our dashboard uh, to provide cutting edge insights and analysis at your fingertips. For the purpose of today, uh, we're focusing on the optimization piece uh, which is within traffic signal control. Um, and here we will be looking at not only just uh, thinking about how to bring our data uh, to existing systems uh, with our sensors for traffic control product, um, but also uh, the smart junctions uh, product, which uh, uses reinforcement learning uh, and applies it to optimize um, for traffic signals. Oh, is that me? <laughs> no worries. Um, so, last year, we presented a 23% reduction in journey times in Manchester. This was the uh, culmination of our Innovate UK project um, and showed that we were able to apply this technology uh, to the real world and deliver impact. But there were still a lot of questions to answer, questions asked here at JCT. Um, how does your system perform outside of Manchester? Um, well, this year, we've scaled to new cities. Uh, we've started working with new controllers, um, and we've also taken on uh, new constraints. What about controlling at different times of day or different times of the year? Uh, well, in Manchester, we controlled through the autumn and the winter times, uh, and then in Peterborough and Cambridge, uh, we've been controlling through uh, spring and summer. Uh, and in terms of different times of day, at the moment, we focused on controlling um, between 7 a.m. and 7 p.m., whilst we develop technical and operational guardrails to facilitate moving towards a 24-hour deployment. The final question that was asked was around the characteristics of the AI agent versus those existing systems, Mover and Scoot, which I think is a, a fair question to ask uh, to help bring that understanding of exactly how does it work or how does it operate. So uh, we took that away uh, and tried to make this as fair a comparison as possible. And we did that for a few reasons. First, in order to earn our stripes uh, and prove ourselves to the industry. Uh, second, because there's a lot to learn from what's out there, and we wanted to engage with the industry to learn exactly what's going on. And third, because we like making life difficult for ourselves, so we try to make it as hard as possible. There are three ways in which we've tried to do this. Uh, first, in the junction selection process. Um, so the junction needed to be, for this experiment, it needed to be suitably isolated from other junctions. Uh, it needed to be operating on the latest mover, mover eight. Uh, and it needed to be uh, calibrated and validated with induction loops which were working. Uh, second was involving an independent evaluator in order to um, calibrate Mover to the best of its abilities, uh, as well as to provide uh, professional expertise and kind of that wider view of the industry. Uh, and then the final part is junction characteristics. Every junction is different, uh, and different junctions are more suitable for different systems. Um, but Dan's going to talk about kind of some of the specifics of the junction which we landed on. So fortunately for us, uh, we had a trial project running in Cambridge uh, where uh, some of the sensors which had been used for uh, traffic monitoring were repurposed and used for smart junctions. 
uh, and we are working with Greater Cambridge Partnership and Cambridgeshire County Council. Some of the project aims uh, were aligned to what we were trying to do. Um, firstly, uh, providing data to support wider network management, um, fe flexibly prioritizing more sustainable transport modes, um, and this final point, which is most relevant, which was assessing the impact of journey times at a single junction compared to mover. Uh, so I'll now hand over to Dan to talk about the junction specifics, um, how he calibrated mover, uh, and also his assessment of the Viva City system on site. Thank Thanks, you. Matt. Uh, hi, everyone. So, um, yeah. Fever City approached me to do uh, an independent evaluation uh, of the system. Here's some of the thoughts here that I've come up with independently. Sorry, Matt, I, I can't read what you wrote here. Could you? <laughs> <laughs> um, so, yeah, so we chose the junction at Cherry Hinton Road. Namely, uh, I mean, it's, it's a difficult junction. I think we've got it up on screen there. So, there's. It's busy during the peaks. I mean, really busy to the point of everything is saturated, but. What we don't get is that all those approaches are kind of busy at the same time. So there's a little bit of ebb and flow. So we have the ability for a control system to kind of move green around. It's something movers really good at, is, is sort of moving green and reducing the shoulders of the peaks to get some benefit. Um, obviously, on, on sites where all the demand increases at the same time, you're going to see less benefit. It's less easy to see uh, the differences in a control system. The site also has a few challenges. So we've got a cycle early start there. Uh, that generates quite a bit of lost time. Um, also, we have two separate right turn stages off the main road. Um, and we also have the busy side roads, uh, both running their own stage. Um, so th there's a reasonably large cycle time there. Um, we looked at the junction, we, we sort of spent a bit of time making sure that everything was working well, uh, checked the config over, uh, making sure that every, there wasn't anything there that, that after the trial we could sort of point to. There are a couple of recommendations later on, um, but we wanted to make sure that the junction was working as well as, as we thought it, it would be. Um, we validated mover during the AM and the PM peaks in the normal way, had a good look at the off peak. One thing we noticed while we were there is that the junction did need to run quite a high cycle time. Due to the amount of lost time there, you just couldn't spin it around quickly. Um, there are PEDs on, on the site, though, so we used a feature in Mover called PEDMAX, which will reduce the cycle should there be a pedestrian demand. They sort of fluctuated between, I think, about 130 and 160 seconds, depending on whether there was a pedestrian down. That's the maximum cycle time it was running. Now, even at 130, that's quite high for a junction with pedestrians. Um, so on that, I kind of eyed it in and did the pedestrian grumpy test by basically observing pedestrians at the junction and making sure none of them were too grumpy while they were waiting. Uh, I think, in fact, I think some of the papers that we've had, some artificial intelligence with facial recognition would probably be quite useful there if we could detect <laughs> smiles and frowns and then hurry call the pedestrian. Um, but, but I think because the junction's so busy, I think pedestrians were happy to wait a little bit longer because they could see, and when obviously demand decreased, the cycle time would, correct, would contract like mover can do. Um, so the, the junction worked pretty, I mean, it does work pretty well on mover. The junction is kind of perfect for mover, really. You've got high demand. Uh, the approaches build up at different times. Um, there's kind of like a couple of peaks. So you have a couple of chances to reduce the shoulders of the peaks on the junction. Um, like I said before, there are a couple of recommendations. So the side roads didn't have the in-loops running on site. And I think due to how busy the side roads are, it would be beneficial there. We also have um, the approach, the northbound approach has like a, a giveaway side road where sort of further down there's a, a park and ride. And I think a lot of people rat run from the park and ride. Now, what that does is mean that if the queue extends past the giveaway, the knock-on effect of people trying to get out of the giveaway 
it, it's, it's difficult for them to get out and it causes a big problem. Now that means that you have to balance that approach a little bit differently. I think perhaps some kind of AI or, AI or incident detection system like we've been talking about in the previous papers would work really well here so that you could kind of control that past the loops that you're actually seeing. Um, so there's an area that we can improve on. So coming to the Viva City observations. So we, we ran Mover and I validated Mover and I had a pretty good handle on how the site was running. Uh, and then we also spent a little bit of time running Viva City. Um, although at the time, it, I think you were still making some changes to the system, so it wasn't the final iteration on street. Um, Matt and Beaver City have been really candid in letting me present this and present the findings as I found them, because I think we've still got a little bit of work to do to kind of get it A1. Um, it was a really interesting project to be involved with, to see it all working. One of the things that was interesting was seeing that the system would extend past the visible point of detection. I think that's something that the system's quite clever with, is because it's an AI and it's a trained system, it understands that if those scenarios are happening, then there could be a queue there. Obviously, that also presents some problems. So it was interesting to see that. At one point, we had a broken down vehicle on the approach, which was making it extend to max on that approach. But uh, Dan tuned it out on site with the laptop, and we actually got that, that working again. So I could see the decisions being made. It was starting to clear queues. The problem with this is it seemed to be a little too aggressive at times. So um, it would be responding to the queues, and then when flow sort of started dropping off a little bit, um, it would see a queue build up and then start chopping the other approaches a little too aggressively, where mover will always try and clear you know, the, the traffic between the X loop and the stop line to, to make everything fair. Vivacity, the Viva City system seemed to be a little bit choppy. Um, it was also struggling to see quite a large queue that built up on the West approach. Um, I think what was happening there is that the, the queue built up and as soon as the queue builds up, the driver behavior changes. It's a little bit the same uh, on the southbound side road. It's a slight uphill approach. Um, and although when you've got a reasonable amount of traffic, the sat flow is quite good, as soon as it starts to queue, there's like a mini roundabout there as well, they, they sort of break down and lose the will to live a little bit, and sat flow does suffer a little bit there. And it looked like the Viva City system was expecting flow to be at a certain rate, where actually it wasn't, and it was struggling to understand um, because of the, you know, the, the detection point was, at, I think, at approximately 40 metres, Matt. Um, so it, although it's trained to understand there could be a queue past that based on the occupancy, because of the way the drivers were behaving on that particular site, it wasn't serving it. Also, control of the right turn stage um, from the Fulborn area, um, I think that's eastbound on, on, the, on the drawing. So it, it was struggling to control the right turn stage, which, like, personally, I was quite pleased it was struggling with, because it's an area that we, we sort of struggle controlling the right turn, certainly uh, under mover control and scoot and things. When, when you have uh, overlapping right turns, it can be a difficult area. You usually have to come up with some tricks to get them work well. The Viva City was also kind of doing the same thing that you get on mover sites, where it was kind of running on a little bit. I think that's an area where I would expect AI to perform much better than some of the existing systems that we have, but I don't think it's quite there yet. Um, overall, to summarize, um, I can see a lot of potential in the system, but I think there's a little bit of work needed to be done on it. Um, there's a load of benefits to having a system that, that can identify site conditions like we've heard from the, the other papers. I think that's an area which I think we need to start looking at. Um, in particular, I'm interested in the sensors that Viva City had. We've had a good chat on site about what they can do. And I think the real gold in this is the fusion of existing legacy systems like Scoot and Mover with AI so that we can build on the, 
like the many years of development that we've had on these systems, I mean, they're a real solid foundation on site. I think we're going to struggle to get things that are better than them. Um, I think augmenting and using things like Viva City and different control strategies to augment what we've got is probably the future, or certainly in the short to medium term. Matt. Fantastic. Um, uh, so Dan's hopefully provided a bit of that qualitative comparison and sort of what he's seen uh, on site, but what have we been able to do in terms of the quantitative side? Um, so we started out by looking at a comparison of the detection technologies in order to be able to um, assess uh, whether or not the same inputs were flowing into the different control systems. Um, we did that by looking at Viva City counts data uh, and comparing that to the mover logs, uh, and we're able to see through day and night that, broadly speaking, they, they correlated pretty well. Um, the difference being is that, um, as Dan's mentioned, Viva City sensors are able to provide much richer data about the vehicle type and behavior. Uh, the other area that we're looking to uh, bring into uh, on the quantitative side is the journey time analysis. We've got two methods here. One is the AMPR sensors uh, that uh, Viva City use. So you can see the upstream sensors um, marked A and then the exit sensors at B so that you can assess the journey time uh, through the different routes through the junction. Um, however, in order to assess kind of uh, all the way to the full length of the queue, uh, we've been working with Cambridge Council to set up one network routes so that you can see um, kind of as far back as in maximum peak conditions. Um, wrapping up, as I know that we've hit the red time, um, we faced several challenges this year, uh, and I think, fair to say, as Dan said, uh, we've learned a lot uh, through this process, and we've tried to be as open and transparent about it as possible. But a lot of those learnings have driven uh, opportunities for product development, uh, firstly in terms of shortening project timelines. Uh, the first time that we went on site, there were roadworks that we didn't know about, and that put us back a couple of weeks or a month. Um, we had Christmas embargoes. We had uh, challenges around uh, setting up controller configs, um, but we've learned a lot from that uh, in this kind of shift from moving from uh, a project uh, last year towards more of a product this year. Secondly, operating under 4G. In Manchester, a lot of the um, connections were wired up, um, and although the sensors operate on uh, 4G in Manchester and Cambridge and Peterborough, uh, for this site, it was operated fully under 4G. Um, and we've come on leaps and bounds in terms of um, how we think about uh, monitoring and using and testing our system to work uh, under those conditions. Um, finally, research breakthroughs. Um, I think a lot of the constraints uh, from moving to new cities this year, um, we've overcome them through some pretty significant research breakthroughs. Um, whether that has been tackling a fixed stage order, which was something that we didn't have, uh, weren't looking at last year, advanced or early stage cycle release, uh, or some of the things that Dan picked up on in terms of the behavior of the system on site. I think we identified when he went there in May or June uh, that there were a number of different pieces of behavior which we needed to uh, bring to make uh, more accurate simulations and to train and test our solutions so that hopefully we're able to uh, release a set of results that show that um, we, we have been able to get there. Um, and I think as someone who's joined Viva City only a year ago, uh, the rate of innovation and uh, bringing some of those uh, challenges into a rapid product development cycle means that it's kind of not so much if we're able to make a gold standard control system, it's kind of a question of when. So quickly, what's next? Uh, once we're able to get uh, to this point, we'll be looking at multi-objective and leveraging um, some of the work that we've already been doing with sensors for traffic control, but bringing that into our optimization control system. We'll then be looking at multi-junction, um, where we've got uh, a couple of junctions on Hills Rose, where we'll be able to uh, start hopefully leveraging the main value proposition of AI, which is being, being able to ingest more data. Um, and then finally, uh, starting to move to new cities and new sites. Um, we've kicked off the project in Dudley, which is really exciting. Um, 
and kind of looking forward to uh, working, working with Dudley and um, Transport for West Midlands. Um, the final, final thing I'll end on is um, to join the conversation. Uh, we've got a user group event in April uh, next year, uh, and we'll have tech webinars and kind of we're always open to bringing thoughts and ideas from everyone here um, uh, into our uh, innovative technology and kind of seeing what we're able to do. Um, there's a QR code up here um, in case anyone wants to uh, register with their name or email. Um, otherwise, I'm the presentation there, and thank you very much for listening, and we'll hand over for questions. Thanks, guys. Is anybody... All right, we've got time for two questions. Mark, over there, if I can get a mic to run there. Where's the next question from? And we'll tee you up ready for... There's one in the middle there, if that's possible. Right. Go for it, Mark. Matt, Dan, thank you. Um, you're obviously going to gather data, and clearly that's a still happening process. What's your strategy? How long are you going to gather data for? And what's your strategy for running the two systems in order to ensure that the conditions that you're gathering data under are equitable for both of the control strategies you're using? Yeah, no, great question. And I think one that uh, you might have already asked me on a call, which I think we had way back. So uh, helpful to ask again. Um, so we want to gather enough data on the journey time side so that it's a representative sample. Um, so we're kind of looking, I mean, ideally for over two months, if not three months of data gathering. Um, in order to make it fair between the two systems, uh, we will be alternating control day by day um, and changing that each week. So in a two-week period, you might have a uh, Monday, Wednesday, Friday where Viva City's in control, and then the following week, Tuesday, Thursday, with Mover operating on the other days. Um, and by doing that, you hopefully get this uh, balance that week by week as well as day by day. Thank you. Okay, then any, anybody else would like to ask a question? I like it when the hand's close to the mic. That's good. That's, that's favoritism, but we'll allow that. Um, you mentioned sort of the training process. How, how long does it actually take to train the system from first installing the detectors on site? Yeah, another, another good question. Um, I guess kind of what, how we think about it and one of the challenges to answering that question is uh, we're doing cutting edge research. So you've kind of got to break away the research developments to this is a new site and this is a new project. How long does it take beginning to end? Um, from usually we want to leave the sensors up and running for a decent period of time, a couple of months in order to be able to collect that data. Um, but then the actual training itself uh, should take kind of uh, within a week, if not less. And we're kind of increasing our compute capacity to bring that down. Um, at the moment, we're obviously trying to improve uh, the algorithm and the development, which uh, has been part of, the, part of what's taking a bit more time. Thank you. Brilliant. Okay, guys, let's give them a round of applause. Uh, Viva City.